Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Search Podcast. So, just pre-warning, uh, today's topic can be a little bit emotionally stressful. Uh, we'll be talking about non-accidental injuries in children. Um, I don't like the term because it, it desensitizes us to the urgency of the problem. And I'm hoping to convince you by the end of this talk that it's something that should be treated with the same urgency as the most dire consequence that you can think of in your emergency room. Because I, I prefer the more traditional term, which is child abuse and neglect, because that's what it really is. Um, the The legal definition in most Western civilization is, at a minimum, any act or failure to act resulting in imminent risk of serious harm death, serious physical or emotional harm, sexual abuse or exploitation of a child by a parent or caretaker who is responsible for that child's welfare. So it's a failure to act or an act in and of itself that has physical or emotional ramifications to the child. Historically, I mean... It's been written about since the first to second century century AD, where um, in various manuscripts there were descriptions of uh, children being stricken intentionally. Um, some of them as slaves, uh, some of them as uh, children and families that would be considered now lower socioeconomically um, than the status quo. Um, but these were kids who were stricken and then brought to an apothecary or the equivalent at the time. And and they were uh, accounts of how these patients had recovered or couldn't recover. And the constellation of, of um, symptoms that they had had and how they were treated at the time. Around about 1860, we started to see uh, real articles emerge on the maltreatment of children. And... Uh, these were mainly from Paris, and they were mainly radiological. It was about a description of old and new fractures that would seem atypical in kids. As we talked about in a previous episode, uh, typically kids don't break bones unless they are high-velocity, high-energy mechanisms, like falling from a significant height or high-speed pedestrian versus car, typically. right? If you're inside the car, even if you're not seat-belted, you might hurt your spine, but you're not going to break long bones. It's very hard to do. By 1944, uh, there was a lot more there, and you were starting to see what would eventually be called shaken baby syndrome, or SIDS. Uh, and that was around about 1944. Uh, the first description by was by Ingram and Matson. They described subdural hematomas in kids that had no other features or findings. And no history of trauma, and it was felt that it was by and large traumatic because what else could it be? Um, the, the syndrome would eventually be called uh, shaken baby syndrome. At one point, Caffey had named it AJR. Uh, by 1962, we'd used the term battered child syndrome, and it was mainly for children in your low single digits, so about six and below, I think, was the first paper. And what they had felt at the time was their definition had widened to include subdural hematomas, multiple soft tissue and bony uh, injuries, and poor hygiene, as well as a failure to thrive and blunted affect in the context of a lack of history or an incongruent history. And that was his exact phrasing at the time in 1962. Since then, uh, we've had multiple papers come out multiple consensus statements come out, and even whole healthcare systems provide a standardized definition of what we should look out for. We've also had whole encyclopedias and a whole uh, slew of publications, and in fact, it's now a complete discipline. Uh, the ACS Trauma uh, TICO program has outlined best practice guidelines for child abuse and intimate partner violence, as well as uh, elderly abuse. And all of these put together have, A, led to more survivors, and B, led to higher screening rates, and C, greater insight 
And last but certainly not least, if you compare 1966 to today, the mortality is significantly lower. Okay. Uh, we now have the advent of standards, not just definitions of what we think it could be or definitions of what we think we should diagnose, but actual standards of treatment management. So it becomes part of our workup to look for these things. And I think that that's the biggest change. It's that we've made it into a an actual diagnosis that we need to seek actively. So with that in mind, today I'd like to focus on the different types the risk factors and the dynamics involved in child abuse and neglect, certain signs and symptoms that you should look for, and what to do once you see them, both in the emergency room and long term, and what the implications are. So when you look at the types, if you open any textbook, they will define five basic types, more or less. Physical, such as beatings. Psycho-emotional, bullying at home, threatening at home etc. Sexual, substance abuse or misuse. This may include drugging them to sleep, yes. And maltreatment and neglect, such as inability to provide them with the uh, activities of daily living, or inability to provide them with adequate nutrition, or inability to provide them with adequate oversight. Inability to be there. Now, traditionally, these have been thought of as segregated things. Now we recognize, especially in the sociology, clinical sociology literature, many of you think that there's no such thing as that, but there is. In the clinical sociology literature, these are thought to be a spectrum. So it's not an exclusivity thing. It's not that they're a victim of physical abuse. It's that more than likely, because there is physical abuse, there may also be a psychological element to it. When there's a psychological element to it, you should evaluate for a sexual element to it or a maltreatment and neglect element. And the risk factors or triggers for this come from three different sources. The child, the perpetrator, which may not be a, a, the mother or the father. It may be somebody who's within the child's closed network or the fi family dynamic in and of itself. So the child, the perpetrator, the person doing the act, and the family dynamic. Factors intrinsic to the child include younger age, less than three, and sickness in the first year of life, as well as documented developmental delay. Intrinsic to the perpetrator of the abuse, well, here's the thing. I'm not sexist, and the data seems to be old, but it's fairly robust. Unfortunately, women have a higher rate of perpetrating abuse, especially when there is a previous history of perinatal illness or an unwanted marriage or unwanted pregnancy. However, higher mortality rates due to child abuse have been reported when the male is the perpetrator, particularly in households where drug misuse and abuse is rampant. Lower levels of education, a previous history of abuse as a child, and social isolation of the family unit have all been implicated as risk factors, in addition to conforming to a class system. So in societies where there is a specific class system that's still in place, and believe it or not, there are societies right now in 2020 where that does exist, they have a high rate of child abuse and neglect. And then there are the factors that are intrinsic to the family structure. Things like forced marriages, the lack of a true family dynamic, prolonged social isolation of the family unit, low income levels, low levels of policing within the area and lack of oversight for family standards, and low access to health care and expertise. All of these weigh into the risk of child abuse and neglect within the society that you live in. Okay, All of these factors are considered risk factors. And when I say risk factors, I mean... They've been identified more stringently as risk factors, some of these, such as the younger age, uh, history of perinatal uh, problems or an unwanted marriage or unwanted pregnancy, history of drug abuse, history of forced ma marriages, especially if it's a societal concern that's forcing people into marriage. All of these things put together have been studied, and their data on them is just as robust as the data on high-fat food and cardiac disease in that you can argue for it and against it. 
and statins have changed the game but the reality is if you're eating a high fat high carb donut type of junk foody diet for most of your life you wouldn't be surprised if you had heart issues in your 70s and 80s right or even 60s this is a similar situation these things are practically attached to the disease and this is a disease the key difference here is that the people who are suffering from the disease aren't just the child themselves it's the child and the people around them it's a perfect storm right and it's a sociological disease it's very sociological and that's why it's very challenging right it's very challenging for us as clinicians to admit to the fact that this is not something where the signs and symptoms are going to show up on day one this is something where it's probably going to be a delayed presentation an improper history and unfortunately your colleagues might miss the diagnosis the first time that the patient presents okay and there may not be a constant injury pattern for you to pick up on so even in terms of the pure constellation and mechanism of injury related to anatomical distribution that might be confusing enough for you not to pick up on it so i wouldn't i wouldn't blame somebody for not picking up on it because traditionally we haven't been very good at that now what are the signs that we should look out for so bruising burns old and new fractures perennial wounds wounds in places that aren't typically seen so on the back because they're wearing a t-shirt under their shorts retinal hemorrhages and signs of strangulation with the burns and the bruising there's a typical shape towards them and the shape usually is indicative of an impact of an object such as a belt or a cane or rod right and you really have to be on the lookout for these things otherwise you'll miss them it's very hard to imagine knuckle markings that are that specific or a looped cord being used or a spatula even being used and I don't want to go any further because I think everybody gets the point but these are things that you need to keep an eye out for being burnt with a coat hanger the use of a fly swatter all of these things constitute abuse and neglect having multiple old and new fractures that aren't just stress fractures they're not isolated because they were playing football they're fractures across a whole joint complex or they're fractures across a long bone that looks like it was literally snapped right with a scapular deviation and a dislocation fractures of this nature they should trigger a response from you right it's not normal to see partially healed fractures here and there and the reason why i'm saying don't be very quick to judge your colleagues is because 10 years of experience have told us we will make mistakes as a medical community and this is an old disease like i said at the beginning of this talk since the first century ad we've been hearing about this we've improved significantly but just because they were cleared before doesn't mean that it's not going to happen again and you have to keep your eye open and you have to be cognizant that this might be missed by somebody else and you might miss it too god forbid so keep your spidey senses tingling whenever you see something address it now when i say address it i mean screen for it so i'm lucky in that the center that i work in now i have a scan team prior to this i was dealing with a lot of patients without the robust scan team and one of my favorite guidelines to use was the standardized physical abuse guideline from the cincinnati children's hospital it's evidence-based it's freely available uh, they don't charge you for it it's not like a black box test so they divide the patient categories into less than six months six to twelve months and twelve to thirty six months in all three categories there should be a social worker consult and a skeletal survey especially if they're under 24 months the skeletal survey should be done to document long bone fractures previous rib fractures and previous hip fractures as well as any old spinal fractures Typically, this will be discrete, okay? In less than six months of age, a head CT should be done because we are very bad at detecting these things clinically. So the brain is the number one reason why kids die. And SIDS and shaken baby syndrome and battered child syndrome 
have taught us that we're not very good at predicting these things clinically until it's too late, unfortunately. So head CT should be done as a screening tool under six months. AST, ALT, and lipase should be done across the board. Troponins should be done across the board if there's a clinical indication, such as a higher AST or ALT level, uh, and there are signs of trauma within the chest, or there's a high probability of chest trauma. Okay. And in addition to that, a head CT and CT facial bone should be done if there's any evidence of facial bruising or any focal neurological deficit that meets PCON criteria. And your regular routine bloods that you would do, such as CBC, PTT, and APTT, INR, etc. Once you've done all of these, a multidisciplinary team should be involved, and they should be involved for the long-term goals and outlook. Now, the team can range, and it can be very elaborate, but it should be a team involving medical providers that are specialist pediatricians who can pitch in, school staff that can be aware of, of what's going on, child care providers that can help deal with the perpetrator and deal with the people around, behavioral health providers, especially psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers, as well as drug and uh, alcoholism counselors, school attendance officers, and having that whole team integrated with you. Advocates, first responders, and court affiliates should also be involved. So in certain countries, there's a child protection law that mandates that a specific society or a specific service gets involved, especially in counties in the States. In other countries, this support unit is usually a voluntary service. And in addition to that, a lot of the time, spiritual support helps. I'm not saying re any religion in particular. I'm saying the community that comes with any type of spiritual support for the person or for the child and the rest of the family helps. And this long-term planning has major benefits, not just to the child themselves and not because you're saving the child's life alone. We've managed to bring down the number of SIDS cases that we see worldwide to nearly zero. It's a never event, right? It's, it's become literally a never event. And it's a long road. It's a long road for us to reach a point where we don't have child abuse and neglect. And it's a long road for us to make the children better once they've suffered from it and make the families better. And there's a significant amount of data. This has been replicated in 1973, 1987, and 2009 with ecological modeling. So it's not just a philosophical discussion right this is literally the way that that our society works all right when you support kids through this you're producing better relationships a better community and a more mature and better society at large so whenever you act upon a question of child abuse or neglect what you're really doing is you're ensuring that that there's a robust care system that's being built, and it's an investment for society at large 10, 15 years down the line. This is Saud al Zaid. Uh, thank you for listening. I tried to keep it a little bit brief uh, because it's one of those more sensitive topics. Uh, please contact me directly, and don't forget to subscribe and review. Thank you, and have a good day.